Hello everyone, welcome to my video series on Pick 18 app programming and today's topic is about GPIO. And in this video I'll talk about I.O. in general and why we need it in microcontrollers. Then we open the data sheet and see how to use GPIO ports in Pick 18 app. Then we go back to our old code for blinking an LED but this time we understand every single line in much more details. Then we modify it to do a more complicated task involving both input and output. No surprise guys to know that microcontrollers cannot exist alone in any circuit. It won't be useful in any way I can imagine. So we have to connect devices or components to the microcontroller to make it useful. And GPIO is what makes the job possible. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output and as the name implies, any GPIO pin can be used as either input or output pin. And we can make use of GPIO pins in many situations like user interface, including LEDs, buttons, keypads, and displays, or taking input measurements of the external environment through sensors, or giving output control, for example, to motors, or finally for transmitting data like having your system connected to the internet. Lifetime may not to waste time, so let's get it done. In pick 18 f 2550 we have a total of 28 pins, and only 4 out of these 28 are not GPIO pins, and these are used to connect to the power supply, ground, and 1 pin for the USB module. Now we're left with 24 IO pins, and these pins are grouped into something called ports, so in pick terminology, a port is just a collection of maximum of 8 pins. And in this microcontroller, we have four ports, namely port A, port B, port C, and finally port E. And generally speaking, there is no difference between using any one of these ports. So once you know how to use one of them, you can use anyone else. So let's focus on port A. Pins named RE0 all the way down to RE5, and don't forget RE6 down here are port A pins. And notice that this port has only 7 pins, not 8. Now let's move to port B. Port B groups all the pins starting from RB0 all the way up to RB7. And it's an 8 pin port. Same for port C. And we have port E here with only 1 pin, RE3. I think many of you guys are asking where the hell is port D. Port D exists only on 40 pin microcontrollers like the one here. Take into consideration that most of these pins, besides the GPIO function, they have another special purpose function. For example, RE0 can either be a GPIO pin or an analog input pin for the AD converter. And here RB0 can be an external interrupt pin. But for now we're concerned about the GPIO function of these pins, so let's get to know how to use it. Here is a section on IO ports. And we can see that there are three registers to control its operation. First is a trice register, then port and let registers. We will be dealing with the first two of these registers, so let's get to know them better. As you already know, any GPIO pin can be used as either input pin or an output pin, and we control this through trice register. Let's take a look at trice A. Obviously, it controls the direction of port A pins. This is an 8-bit register, like every register in this microcontroller, and any bit in this register can be either 0 or 1. So 1 means a corresponding pin is going to be an input pin, and 0 means it's going to be an output pin. So if we fill up trice A like this, the bit in position 0 is set to 0, so RA0 will be an output pin. Same for RA1, RA2, and RA3 are going to be output pins, but RA4 is an input pin, since the bit in position 4 is set to 1. Same goes for RA5 and RA6. Don't forget that RA7 doesn't exist, so writing to the 7th bit has no effect. Now let's move to board register. You can write or read any bit in this register, but the result of any operation depends on the direction of the corresponding pin. If a pin is set to output and we write as a corresponding bit in port register, then what we write appears as a voltage on that pin. So putting a zero in the least significant bit in port A leads to zero volts on RE0, and writing one in the next bit leads to five volts on RE1. And from the previous example, these pins are output pins. But if we write to an input pin, this doesn't change anything. 
So what about reading best in this board? Reading an output pin simply gives a value of written before. But reading an input pin like RA5, for example, reads a voltage on that pin. So if the pin is connected to any voltage between 0 and 0.8 volts, you read a 0. And if it's connected to anything between 2 and 5 volts, you read a 1. Okay guys, you can stop the video here, take a break, and of course come back because in the next not few minutes, we're going to brainstorm our minds to get the best code for blinking LEDs. Here we open MPLAT, and this is a blink project from my previous video. And if you guys don't follow, we wanted to blink an LED constantly on and off for every 500 milliseconds. And here is the schematic for the circuit. We're connecting the LED to RB0. So let's get into the process of writing code. First thing is first, we're connecting the LED to RB0. So this makes us want to make RB0 an output pin. In MPLAB, we can either write to the whole register or write to individual bits. And in this line, we're writing zeros to all bits in trice B register, making every pin in port B an output pin. And that's the case for the current project, but maybe, and it's big maybe, for other projects, you don't want to do that. So how can we change only RB0 to be an output pin? This is done by writing this line of code. Trice B bits dot RB0 equals 0. This line changes only RB0 to be an output pin. And by the way, every pin in any port is an input pin unless you change it. So this makes all pins support B input pins except for RB0. And let us understand this line better. Trice B bits is a structure defined in XC.H. And RB0 is just a member of that structure. You make a 0 so you make the corresponding pin an output pin. As I said before, we could have used any other pin in this microcontroller, but for professional courtesy, if we use port A for this project, we will not get the desired output. And that's because port A by default is configured to be an analog input port, and we need to manipulate trice A and another couple registers to get it to work as a digital output port. So for simplicity, I choose to work with port B. And here is the infinite loop you will see in almost every embedded system code. And this loop prevents the microcontroller from reaching the end of the main function and then executing the code all over again from the beginning. This may not seem significant in this case since deleting the while loop will only make the microcontroller not just execute these lines forever but also this line too. So, generally speaking, whatever code you want to execute forever, you put it inside the while loop and whatever code you want to execute only once, you put it up here before the while loop. And be careful guys, putting anything after the while loop here will make them never see the light. So let's move on to understand what's inside of these braces. What the FL block does here is flipping the status of RB0. So here we read RB0. If it's a 1 or high, we make it a 0 or low. And the else block just does the opposite. And here's a delay MS function. And this function literally makes the microcontroller does nothing for the given amount of time. So if we come in this function here, we want to get a chance to see the flipping between high and low on RB0. So, in short, this function makes the microcontroller does nothing for 500 milliseconds, which gives us the time to see the blinking of the LED. If you remember guys, this was not the code I've used in my previous video. Okay, I fooled you. The use of the FLC statement here is quite unprofessional, and you will see embedded system dudes write this line of code instead. Consider this a professional courtesy. So, if you have background in C, you know that the hash sign does the XOR operation, and XORing anything with one is exactly as the NOT operation. So what this line does is flipping the status of RP0 every time it's executed. Which is exactly what the FLC statement did, but in less code. And this guy is called bit masking, and he'll use it a lot in manipulating bits and registers. So let's move to testing the code and Protoss. First we compile it, and then go to Protoss, and run the simulation. No surprise it's working since I have tested it many times before recording the video. 
And now we move on to building another project, and this time we use both input and output. And what the circuit does is waiting you to press the push button connected to RB1, then turn on the LED for 3 seconds and turn it off again. And of course you can do this as many times as you want. And this time we start by building the circuit first, after that we write the code. We've used LEDs before, but the new component here is a push button, so let's get to know how to connect it to a microcontroller. Here is a simple schematic that does the purpose. We have a push button with one end connected to RB1 and the other end connected to ground. So when you press this button, it acts as a short circuit connecting RB1 directly to ground, and we have zero volts on this pin. But what is the voltage on RB1 when the button is not pressed? Simply, the answer is we don't know, and in this case we've just made RB1 a floating pin, which is a fancy description of a pin with unknown voltage. We don't love unknowns in what we create, because unknown voltages mean unknown behavior, and of course if it was that straight, I wouldn't bother explaining it at all. Here is one smart solution. We connect a resistor between RB1 and 5V, so when we press a button, we have the desired 0 volt on RB1, exactly as the previous schematic did. But now if we release a button, the pin is connected to 5 volts through the resistor we've just put. By the way, the resistor is called a pull-up resistor, since it pulls off the pin to higher voltage. And how much ohms we choose for R? Anything between 1K and 10K is just fine. Port B has these pull-up resistors already built in inside the microcontroller. This means that we could use the dummy circuit we've seen first without the external pull-up resistor, but you need to turn on these built-in resistors in your code. So, is the genius solution I've just found out turned out to be useless? Of course not, because only port B has these built-in resistors. If the button were connected to any other port, you must use a pull-up resistor. So let's build our own circuit on Portus. First, let's go and pick up the components from here. First, pick the pick 18 f 2550 Pick 18 f 2550 Okay, and the LED. And the resistor. And finally, the push button. Simply write push button in this box. Thank me for this step later. Fortunately, we're not searching for a needle in a haystack. Click OK. And OK, let's place the components in the grid. Here's the microcontroller, the LED, and finally, the button. But we need to resistor, so let's copy this. Copy to clipboard and paste here or anywhere else. We change this to be 300 ohms so we don't get the LED dead like the previous video. And here to 10K. 10K. This is a pull up resistor. So first let's connect the LED. Drag the resistor here to 0 and the LED down. Connect them. And let's go and pick up the ground. Right here. And first, let's rotate this button. We need it vertically. And mirror it. Oh. And put it down here. No. Drag the resistor here. And again, rotate it. I'll make it in the same line with the button. Connect RP1 here and connect the other end to ground. We need the 5 volts, so let's go for power and connect it here. Now we've just finished building our circuit, so let's go and start writing the code. So here is MP Lab. I've created a new project named it. Easy IO, here it is, and created a main.c file. Just copied all the configuration bits from the previous video exactly as they are, since we're using the same oscillator settings and same oscillator speed for megahertz. So 
it's ok and this line here because we're going to use the delay ems function here is the oscillator speed for megahertz and let's start by writing the first lines of code in this project so and we are using rb0 as an output pin so try speed bits dot rb0 equals zero make it an output pin rb1 is an input pin so try speed bits dot rb1 equals 1 and if you guys remember if we deleted this line it will make a difference because by default every pin is an input pin so this line is just redundancy and here is the y loop make it infinite loop so first thing we do in this loop is to make sure that the lead is off so port b bits dot rp0 equals 0 and then we constantly check for the status of RB1. So, as long as the button is not pressed, RB1 is connected to 5 volts. And if the button is pressed, the RB1 is connected to 0 volts, so we constantly check the status of RB1. If it's 0, so we turn on the LED. So, we make an if condition for B bits dot RB1. This time we read it and it check its value. If it's zero, means the button is pressed. Go and turn on the LED. And then wait for three seconds. We use the delay MS. Three seconds or 3000 milliseconds. So here it is. And we build the project. Then go to Protoss, click on Run Simulation. I've uploaded the code to Protoss, so here it is. Nothing happens as expected. Press the button. One, two, three. It worked, and let's try it again. Oh, fine. We go back to the code and explain it in more details. The first two lines are crystal clear, so let's skip them. Then we go inside the infinite loop. Here is the first line here keeps the LED off until someone presses a button. Then we constantly check the status of RB1 to be 0, and this method is called polling. And there is a more efficient way of doing it using an rod but it's not our subject here. So again, if someone presses a button, this condition is true, we go inside, execute these two lines. The first line turns on the LED by putting 5 volts on RB0. The second line keeps the microcontroller doing nothing for 3000 milliseconds. Then we go and execute the while loop again, makes the LED off and the process repeats. That's it for now guys, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you want to know the steps of uploading code to the microcontroller and connecting it on a brick board, watch my previous video. Thank you guys for watching, see you in my next video.